So the next real episode in this series on physical modeling is taking a little longer than I had hoped because it's a very big topic and I'm having to do some extra research to make sure I don't give you any bad information. But that is coming soon. So now we're three episodes in and we should be getting fairly used to making fun and playable sounds. There are still a lot of fundamental topics that we haven't really dived into. I could spend a lot more time talking about oscillators and filters than we already have. And I'll probably do some of that today. But there's just a lot of material to cover, and I wanted to make sure that we were having fun playing before we get too bogged down in theoretical details. But I think at this point we have our mechanics down well enough that we should be ready to explore some more fun things here and there. And the fun thing I want to explore today is the alias oscillator. So hypothetical scenario. You are sitting at home, minding your own business, drinking a latte, watching some funny animal videos. When suddenly you get a phone call from the mayor and you ignore it because you assume it is spam. But then the mayor texts you and apparently there's an emergency. And as it happens, you are the city's sound guy and you are responsible for handling all sorts of sonic emergencies. And the mayor is very flustered and he tells you that violent extremists have infiltrated the hockey game and they are going to blow up the hockey game unless you meet their demands. And their demands happen to be, they would like a convincing bassoon sound in the next 19 minutes. And you say, well, that's very strange, but okay, I will, um, I'm gonna open up my sampler here and grab my stock bassoon sample. And the mayor says, no. It can't be a sample. They insist that it be synthesized. And furthermore, you can only use free and open source software. And you protest that this is a very odd and specific demand. But then the mayor says, look, do you want them to blow up the hockey game? And if you're like me and you live in Pittsburgh in 2024, you might be thinking, yes, yes, please blow up the hockey game. Put us out of our misery. But since this is a hypothetical scenario, let's pretend that you are more altruistic than that and you don't want to see anybody get hurt and maybe your city has a better hockey team. So let's just uh, play our bassoon sound, the sample, just to remind ourselves what a bassoon sounds like. All right, so now let's open up Surge. And I'm going to start, as I always do, by loading up my MPE init patch. I'm going to make some slight modifications to this patch in the next episode. We will, once and for all, remove any Y-axis control over the cutoff. I've already done that in this one. And we'll also add in the velocity curve that we came up with last episode. And then that will always be there for us in the future. Now, ordinarily to make that bassoon sound, I would suggest starting with a pulse wave. And then if you find the right width, maybe a 24 decibel low pass filter. That's probably a good starting point. I might also try some sync. We've not discussed sync yet, but it's a, it pitch shifts your waveform, but also re-triggers it at the start of every cycle. So it, it does what this 
graph is going to show us. And that's a good way of finding a timbre that is not readily available in your basic wave shapes, as is the pulse width modulation. So. So ordinarily I'd start with that, but it can take some time to dial in the right values for these things. And in our stupid scenario, we don't have enough time. So we're going to cheat. And I'm going to switch to the alias oscillator. This is one of those cool oscillators, like we've looked at the twist already, and the twist has lots of different things you can do with it. Alias is like that also. So we're going to come down here to the shape and see that we have a bunch of different options. Today we're going to use the additive shape, and it gives us this thing that's kind of a sawtooth. But if we click this edit button, we get this thing. Now most of the sounds we've used so far have been using what's called subtractive synthesis. And what happens with subtractive synthesis is you get these basic wave shapes and they produce a lot of harmonics. And there are different sets of harmonics associated with each wave shape. So the sawtooth will have all of the harmonics, which will decrease in amplitude as they increase in frequency. Whereas a square wave will have I think only the odd harmonics. I don't want to take the hour and a half that it would take to explain harmonics to you right now. Put simply, any sound can be analyzed and reconstructed as a set of sine waves at various frequencies. We have the fundamental frequency, which is the sine wave corresponding to the pitch that we perceive. That's going to be the lowest of these frequencies, usually, and also the strongest frequency, usually. But then above that, we're going to get a bunch of other little sine waves of higher frequency and lower amplitude. And these are referred to as overtones or partials or harmonics. Um, when we call them harmonics, that usually means something specific the frequencies are going to fall in integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. And that's what we see in this graph here. So this first one is, say we were playing a frequency of 100 hertz. The second one would be 200 and then 300 and so on. And this is an infinite series, basically. Although our range of hearing only goes up so far. And what we do most of the time when we use our sawtooth or our square wave is we generate this complicated waveform, and then we remove some of these frequencies with our filters. And that's known as subtractive synthesis. And a lot of synthesizer technique and culture and common practices are based on subtractive synthesis, just because in the early days of synthesizers, uh, when everything was analog, it was much easier to produce these harmonically rich waveforms like the sawtooth in the square and then filter them away because you could do that with one oscillator. Whereas if you wanted to build your sound from nothing out of adding these harmonics, you're going to need many oscillators playing sine waves. And that would be very expensive and difficult to accomplish in analog synthesis. But now that computers are faster and smaller than they were in the 1950s, additive synthesis has become much more practical than it used to be. So each of these little bars is one of our harmonics. And we can close this editor here and see what wave shape these harmonics are going to make. And this is kind of a sawtooth. We can double click on each one of these bars to just make it go away.
and you're not necessarily going to use a filter with additive synthesis. So let me turn that off. Now you can hear as I'm playing these higher notes, there's kind of a fuzzy hiss going on. And if you listen really close, probably on headphones, you can hear that there are actually tones in there, kind of nasty sounding, scratchy tones. Can you hear that whistle going up and down? That's what aliasing sounds like. And that's where this oscillator gets its name. That has to do with harmonics being, having higher frequencies than our sample rate can properly represent. And that's typically something you want to avoid in digital synthesis. So on most good synthesizers, surge included, you will do something like oversampling. So your output rate, sampling rate might be 44.1 kilohertz, but your processing sampling rate is gonna be four times that. And that will make these high notes a lot nicer. Your frequencies will have to get a lot higher before you'll start to hear them make these horrible sounds. Now the alias oscillator is actually kind of made to celebrate those terrible sounds. It's kind of a lo-fi tool. I guess maybe there's some nostalgia associated with, with these awful sounds. And similarly, we also have this bit crush control. Oh, I hadn't noticed that before, so the maximum bit rate on this sound is eight bits, whereas normally we would use 16 or higher. And we can crush this more to hear how much worse it gets as we get fewer and fewer bits. The bit rate is not the same as the sample rate distortion that we get, but they're both they're both artifacts of the same problem, which is we don't have enough resolution to represent the sound that our math is generating. So now it's sounding a lot noisier. So I would normally recommend not using this oscillator unless you're specifically making something like lo-fi beats for study. Because if your genre expectation is that your sound is gonna sound like trash, then this is great. This is really cool. But if you're, if you're trying to please violent extremists who are about to blow up the uh, hockey game, let's turn our bit rate all the way back up and let's turn our filter back on. Now the filter doesn't really remove the aliasing. The waveform is sort of corrupted before it gets to the filter and it's gonna produce spurious frequencies that will even occur below your fundamental. And once they're in there, there's really no way to remove them. So what you wanna do and what most modern synths will do is oversample in that processing phase. but the filter does help a bit make it more pleasant. So now you have to listen a lot harder to hear that weird whistly sound. So by this point, I'm sure the hockey game has exploded because I took all this time to explain this stuff, but let's pretend that I didn't. And I'm just going back to using the alias sound to make the bassoon. I'm going to go back to my um, sampler for a second. 
and I'm just going to create a little loop here. And I've got a spectrum analyzer here. And now I can just see what my harmonics are. So my first and second harmonic are about the same. The second one's a little higher, maybe. So I can go back to Surge, and I can just draw in those harmonics in Alias. Get rid of these. My third and fourth harmonics are a bit higher. And I can tell which harmonics these are, mostly because I'm used to looking at these graphs. But it's telling me the notes here, and this is the C2, this is the C3. C this is an octave up, so it is twice the frequency of the fundamental. And the third harmonic is a perfect fifth above that. And then we have another octave. And then these follow a predictable pattern for where the harmonics will occur. So higher third and fourth, and then a lower fifth. Now I'm going to pause the video while I get the rest of these harmonics the way I want them. So the relative proportions of these harmonics have a lot to do with the character of the sound and how we distinguish a bassoon from an oboe or a violin or a flute. Also, I think I need an EQ in here. So there's a bassoon. Our hockey game did explode. I had to pause the video and do some things and edit some things out. So we went over our 19 minutes and we did not make it. And I'm not sure the bassoon is really convincing enough for the extremists. even if I had gotten it done in time. But you know, you win some, you lose some, especially when hockey is involved. And like I said, I wouldn't recommend this oscillator for a lot of purposes, but it should be sufficient to play around with and see if you enjoy additive synthesis. And the reason I was actually looking at Alias, when I started doing these videos, I was asking around to see if there was any topic that people were particularly interested in, in covering. And one guy said he was interested in making sounds for microtonal music. Now, I've done a few things, a few microtonal things on this channel, but I'm not really a microtonal expert. I just have one system that I really like. So it hadn't occurred to me that you might want to control what harmonics you're using in your sound when you're working with a microtonal system. The harmonic series, these integer multiples of our fundamental, 
contains a bunch of frequencies which are very close to notes of the major scale. They're not exact, and some of them are missing because while our 12 tone equal temperament scale that we normally use is probably influenced somewhat by the harmonic series, does not match up perfectly mathematically, but it's fairly close, and so our harmonics are more or less in tune with our scale. But if you were doing, say, 13 equal divisions of the octave, then that might not be the case, and you might want to be more careful about what harmonics you have in your sounds. And so I think additive synthesis is a good way to try to achieve that. So one thing you could do to be safe from all dissonant harmonics is to only use the octave harmonics. So that would be the second, fourth, the eighth, and the sixteenth. And that's going to give us a bit of a pipe organ sound. So let me load up the tuning system that I like. This is not an equal temperament. It's a just intonation based on stacking intervals of seven fourths. And I'm going to turn off the x axis pitch on my instrument so that we will only hear the scale and not my intonation problems. Now, I don't know, I haven't studied enough to tell whether this is really better than a more fuller set of harmonics. It's also going to be a matter of taste. I would think that for a microtonal system, part of the fun might be listening to how it relates or does not to the harmonic series. But I do think in that case it was a little bit nicer with just the octaves. Another thing I'm going to try is I'm going to, I'm going to keep all these harmonics in here, but I'm going to make them very quiet. And I'm just going to accentuate the seventh. It's here. And the fourteenth. Because that's going to be an octave of the seventh. And that should make sense with this particular system because it's built on this seventh. Try removing all the other harmonics. I think that does kind of that does kind of work. I'm going to turn my x-axis pitch back on. Another intuition I had about these, and I don't have I don't have a really good rational reason for for this, I don't think, was the idea that if we use only prime number harmonics, maybe that will be cool. I use prime numbers a lot when doing 
additive wavetable synthesis in Serum because it's a, it's a way of getting bellish sounds. They're not really perfect emulations of bells by any means, but they do have a bellish quality to them. And I think maybe when I started working with this seventh system, I started with bell kinds of sounds, and maybe that was because bells typically have overtones that are not harmonics, that are not integer multiples of the fundamental, and we call those inharmonic overtones. And I think maybe when we use those, we create less of an expectation that our harmonics are going to be in tune with our scale. So I'm going to try some prime numbers here and see how that goes. So we'll have some two and some three, some five, keep a good bit of seven, 11 and 13. I do like the prime numbers for that. I'm not sure if I have a good explanation of why. And I'm also not sure that they'd work in as well in a different system. Okay, that was it. That was our little exploration of the alias oscillator. And I just have a couple things I want to mention before I go. A week or two ago, I was interviewed by Roger Lynn the inventor of the Linstrument. That was very exciting for me. I don't think I've ever been interviewed before, at least when it wasn't for a job, which is a very different thing. And Roger asked some great, great questions and I did my best to answer the hell out of them. So if you're interested in reading that, there's a link in the description. Also, someone asked me where I learned about this stuff. And the answer is, a lot of places and a lot of years of experimentation. But there are a few sources that were really helpful to me. One of them was actually the manual from the Nordlead 2. She should be able to find on the internet. That has a really good section in it on subtractive synthesis and was my introduction to a lot of these concepts. There was also Richard Nickel of Pittsburgh Modular Synthesizers who initiated me into the world of modular synthesis. And that has been a great deal of fun and taught me a lot of things. And finally, there's this book, Musical Instrument Design by Bart Hopkin. I picked this up maybe more than 20 years ago. I think it's still in print. I certainly hope it is. And this is just a fantastic book. The quality and quantity of information is ridiculous. And there are a lot of cool drawings in there as well. And he will basically just teach you everything you need to know about anything regarding making things that make sounds. And I found out a couple years ago that he actually has a YouTube channel. And it has some ridiculously low number of subscribers, given that he is the guy who literally wrote the book on musical instrument design. But this is a fantastic channel where he, where he plays some of these instruments that he's made, and a lot of them explore really interesting ideas. And it's just fascinating to watch, and I'm so glad it exists. All right, I think that's it for today, and I will see you soon for our episode on physical modeling synthesis. Thanks for watching.